What's up, Z-Pack? It's your boy, Z-Dog MD, Dr. Zubin Nemanja. Okay, today we have a very special guest, and this conversation is important to all of us because every single person who touches patients understands that in the last 10 or 15 years, we've seen a sea change, a dramatic shift in what's going on on our front lines in the emergency departments, and that is the surge in behavioral health crises, in other words, people seeking care for behavioral health issues. And they are overwhelming our capacity and our training and our ability to care for them as anything less than subhumans. Now that sounds provocative, but that's what's effectively happening right now in our emergency department. So today's guest is Dr. Denise Brown. She and I go way back to our Stanford training days, except she was smarter than me. She went and did a thing at Vanderbilt and quality stuff and like IHI and became chief resident, whereas I was rocking myself to sleep and crying while she was doing that. So we've connected after all these years because she works now for a company called Vituity, which is working on really, really, really robust and unique ways of handling this behavioral health crisis, as well as other things. So let's just dive right into it. I'm going to take your comments as well, because we're live. Dr. Janice Brown, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. <laughs> your brother, Dave Saran, mm. was my resident back at Stanford. Yeah. And he went on and did anesthesia, and now he's up in Reno. Yeah. Doing work. Yeah. So we go back to the Saran days, and he's like one of the most zen people I ever met. And, you know, I think I beat that into him at an early age, because he is my baby brother. But, you know, we can ask him about that. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to we'll have to get him on the show. So so tell me a little bit about your background. Let the Z Pack kind of understand where you're coming from with everything you're doing now. Yeah, sure. Well, so like you, I'm an internist by training. I've been a hospitalist since I finished all the stuff you were kind of describing. My uh, condolences. In 2001. Yeah. yeah, thanks. And uh, have been lucky enough to be part of an organization that really was founded in the emergency department. And I kind of grew up with. Um, creating a hospitalist practice that was closely tied to the ED. Which what? Wait, know, that's like sleeping with the enemy. It is. It's a, it does sound very counterintuitive, but what I came to find was by partnering with my ED colleagues, we actually started taking really good care of patients and work was actually fun. Wait, you mean you don't hate the folks? I actually the love them. You work as a team. Uh, and we have a good time together. So what happens if you disagree about an admission? So that's what's fun. We take care of it like the professionals that we are. Heaven forbid. I know. It does sound crazy. Here, oh. I don't go running to the CMO or complaining to the department chair. I um, handle my own business. And I'm a professional and they're professionals and we all treat each other like the professionals we are. I know it sounds it's a like a lot I, of adulting going on. It's that, kind of frightening. Uh, it makes me very uncomfortable. Yeah, I know. Okay, okay. So, so you start. So you were with this group. Yeah. So with this group, what we found was that um, coming together to sort of address problems in the emergency department actually really expanded the care for everybody. So take palliative care, for example, which is near and dear to my heart, mm, hospice forever. And I've seen some of your excellent videos on the subject. Thank what you. we realized was that the best place to address palliative care problems was right in the emergency department. So what if we trained ED docs to have challenging conversations that, yes, intubated and sedated is an excellent mental status exam, but what if we actually talked to somebody before <laughs> that happened? And how could we teach one another how to do that better? And so we really kind of created this environment where we realized people were desperate for this kind of knowledge. And by teaching them how to just kind of tweak the care that they were providing a little bit, you could actually then have some really impressive changes, not only in the way that care was being delivered to patients, but the way that you felt about the care that you were delivering, the way you felt about your shift when you went home, the kind of joy that you thought you had when you started medical school, you could actually take that home with you at the end of a shift. You, you, so so uh, everything you just said is, 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 again, illustrates why I really wanted you to come on the show. Because in the end, what we're talking about is so much of this, what we're calling now moral injury, this idea that we are forced to bear witness to, participate in, or fail to prevent things that deeply transgress our morals. And one of those is people coming into the emergency department with no discussion, getting intubated, getting sedated, getting uh, on, a, on, a, on a billion tubes and wires, and sent up to the ICU to die under torture, doesn't make us feel good. No. And when we go home, we take it out in some way, either physically, emotionally, spiritually, whatever it is. And so you're saying that you actually created a structure where you were starting to train people on having tools to deal with this? So basically, after pulling over to the side of the road and sobbing hysterically because there was a dead dog on the side of the road, and I didn't cry when my patient got intubated, but somehow 
pulling over seemed like the best course of action because there was an animal that had been injured, wow. I realized that I had to do something about it. So that was how we sort of approached this palliative care crisis. And it was really transformative, not only for me personally, but for all of the other doctors, nurses, staff that I worked with. And to me, this sort of crisis in behavioral health is exactly the same, if not more so. And, and I can't just watch it happen. Um, I think we're all sick and tired of the way that folks who come into our emergency departments are in crisis and the way that we are unable to basically address that. We've got to do something about it. And so I'm very proud that I think we may be on the right track. And so I'm excited to talk to you about that so, today. So, because this is a crucial disaster right now. And again, it leads to moral injury among caregivers and terrible inhuman care among people suffering from uh, behavioral health issues. Now, let me back up for one second because I want to ask you this. This group that you were a part of, these emergency docs and hospitalists, it evolved into something a little bigger over time. All physician-led, though. Yeah. So founded in 1975. It's actually a really cool story. A bunch of guys came back from Vietnam having been uh, docs over there and uh, surfers in San Diego. And uh, at the time, emergency medicine was like a brand new thing, right? It, it basically didn't exist, much like hospitalist medicine, really, right. in the sort of like late 90s, early 2000s. And uh, these guys said, what if there was a different way? What if we came together? What if we sort of formed a partnership where what we were mainly doing was taking care of people and we could figure out how to run the business kind of together collectively as a group? But what if we founded a group that was based on transparency and fairness and autonomy? And if we ran it by docs for docs, for the good of all, what if what if we did that? And so in 1975, they founded a group they called California Emergency Physicians, and uh, we've evolved over the years. Um, I started hospitalist practice with them in 2001 um, in the Bay Area after I finished uh, with my time at Stanford. Um, and we started doing some urgent care. We started doing some hospitalist medicine, realizing that these problems that they were having in the emergency department, we could help solve by adding hospitalist stuff. Well, that turned out pretty cool. Mm. Then we realized we were having trouble with the ICU folks, like getting people upstairs quick enough in order to deal with sepsis. So what if we added that component? So it was never like a land grab. Like you'll hear a lot of these other groups where they're just, they just want to you know, accumulate all these hosp hospital-based practices or something like that. We were like, we have a problem. We want to be able to solve the problem. Let's do something about it. And so little by little, we've sort of grown our scope, but it's always fundamentally been about the unplanned worst episode of your life. Who's going to be there to help you take care of it? And how are we going to work our way through that together? And how are we going to kind of form a therapeutic alliance to be able to take care of you from the minute you hit the door until wherever it is that you need to go next? It's a very different concept to be able to sort of say... I'm going to take care of you. I may not make you better. I may not be able to cure, cure you, but I'm actually going to take care of you today. And if it's not me and I need a partner's expertise, I'm going to go get that for you. But I want you to know that it's my partner who's going to be caring for you. See, see, this to me is the heart of what they call the patient experience and this idea. And guess who's actually making it happen? Clinicians. That's right. And that's why companies like yours that are physician-led are the only companies I led on the show in sponsored roles because they are the ones that are making this happen. You can be an administrator and a clinician and do really good in the world because you're there with that patient taking care of them. Yeah. And I think that's what makes it really, really tremendous. So, okay, so now we know kind of where this company came from. Now, why was behavioral health a problem for you guys? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think any of us who are sort of in that first responder, you know, kind of early on front door of the hospital, so to speak, have seen things really change from from even like 2005. It's just been this kind of astronomical increase uh, in the number of visits for behavioral health. I mean, there's something like, I think the statistics will tell you that 50% increase in adult visits for uh, behavioral health concerns, mm. that's over... 15% of anybody who walks through the door, adult-wise, mm. are, are typically there for behavioral health issues. And what happens? What happens is they don't get the same kind of care that you would get if you came in with chest pain. You just don't, right? You get parked in room seven. If you're agitated, uh, maybe you get slapped in restraints. Maybe you get a, a, a milligram of Haldol in your butt. How is that care? You know, it, it, it's, it's funny because when I was a resident it was that's just what we did yeah and in fact we got conditioned it was room think, four it was room four 
That's right. We remember it. <laughs> yes, we do. And that room was scary because you would go in there with somebody who was clearly having the worst, you know, event of their lives, and they're terrified, and you're there with them, and it's locked, and it, it was inhuman. Yeah. But at the time, of course, like you said, you would pull over for a dog because that changed your paradigm, but you were so desensitized to everything else that we do. So it's a, it's a huge... You know, and, and on top of this, I think I would add in... There's probably been some growth because of things like uh, psychologist Jonathan Haidt and others have talked about this idea that we're creating a generation of very fragile, uh, a, a fragile generation that is exposed to a lot of social media, a lot of online bullying, a lot of overprotecting. So they don't develop a lot of resilience. And so the tendency, they're more depressed, they're more anxious, they're more suicidal. So now there, a lot of them also, there's a little less stigma to going to seek help. However, when you get there, that's when the stigma hits. Yeah. And that's yeah. the real bummer part, right? And I think that's actually true not only for our patients, but all of what you just said is also true for our providers as yes, well. Yes, right? a thousand percent. And that to me is the kind of like double edged sword of why this really is a crisis because it's a crisis for the patients. We're not providing the best care for, but it's also a crisis for the people who wish that they could be doing something different. Mm. And and that to me is the is the kind of double tragedy. And then it's a crisis for the guy who's in the next room, who's not in room 4, who's in room 5, who now has to deal with either a grumpy doc or someone who has that kind of compassion fatigue that's bringing that to their next encounter with whomever. So everybody loses. You know that and that's a key point. And let's talk about nurses for a second. Emergency department nurses who make the thing hum. God right? bless them. God bless them. I've spoken for ENA a couple times. I've never been with such a passionate audience that cares so much about human beings, despite being in a military zone every single day, right? Every single yeah. shift. And it's exactly that. It's this desensitization. So bed six suffers for bed five's poor treatment. And the truth is, then you weave in the violence. So these are agitated, ignored, dehumanized patients. How are they going to behave in the emergency department in a way that's dangerous? Right. And then we have hashtag silent no more about violence against healthcare providers. So, so, so if we're going to be silent no more, we need to act differently. That's how we're silent no more. Mm. So we're, we're not silent no more by banging on the glass and screaming at our hospital administrators because I don't know that that's actually going to be terribly effective. Mm. We're silent no more by changing our approach to the way these people are cared for. I mean, I am i don't know about you, I've i have been assaulted in, in a room where I've been taking a history and physical from, from a patient on a locked ward. It's scary, right? Pushing that panic button changes you because after you've pushed it once, the threshold to push it again is yeah. it ain't it ain't so high, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so how do we do it? How do we do it differently? And I tell you, everything that we are typically doing is wrong. Everything. Pretty much everything. Everything. Okay, now I'm interested <laughs> severely because anytime you tell me what we do in medicine is wrong, I intuitively go absolutely. It's why we feel I think the I think I think smart people put in the system know there's something wrong. It's like living it's living in the matrix and going, there's something deeply, deeply disturbed about everything in reality here. And yet I have to do this if I'm gonna get a paycheck, play the game, get promoted, stay in my job, make partner. And yet we know, oh my gosh, what we do is wrong. So tell me about behavioral health. What are we doing that's wrong? Well, let's just think about the panel that you get. So let's say you're acutely agitated and you show up to the emergency department. That isn't if you've already been brought by the by the police or the paramedics and put on hold and potentially restrained, right? Mm -hmm. um, you're not addressed in the same way that you would be addressed if you had chest pain. And I really think that you'll hear me kind of harken back to sepsis and chest pain because I think these are things where we have really good protocols. People respond immediately or stroke was another good one, right? Yeah. Where all hands are on deck. Everyone has, they know what they're supposed to be doing and they do it well, mm. right? So so you've ordered your labs, you've given your fluid bolus, we're waiting on the lactate, we've called the ICU, like bam, 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 bam. Everybody's like, yeah, we got this. Mm. Okay. Behavior Juxtapose huh? that <laughs> to uh, the, the floridly agitated guy. Maybe it's a dual diagnosis, maybe there's substances on board, who knows? doesn't matter. They're agitated. They're scared. And what do we do? We restrain them. We put them in a room. We get a guy with a set of handcuffs who's a security guard or a cop who's standing in front with his arms crossed. 
What's therapeutic about that? Right. While we're waiting, we're checking a UA, a thyroid panel, an <laughs> RPR. I mean, seriously, yeah. what, 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 what is that? Right. And, and so we're spending all this time. Are they medically stable? Are they medically stable? Well, I don't know. Well, I don't know what to do with them. Put them on a hold. We'll deal with it later. Mm-hmm. When what we could do is say this individual's walkie talkie, they can swallow a turkey sandwich. Um, chances are they're medically stable. Right. I mean, you and I both know what medically stable looks yeah, like. Yeah. Okay. I don't need but an the RPR. But the potassium is three point yeah. four. Yeah. Denise. Exactly. Um, do I care? Probably not. No. no, I don't. Now, are there some legitimate medical reasons that people can be acutely delirious or psychotic? Absolutely. But those look different, and you can pretty much rapidly assess those. Yeah. Okay. So after you sort of determine that somebody's medically stable, what you don't want to do is escalate and coerce. Mm. What you want to do is have a staff who's educated and trained in exactly the opposite, in de-escalation, in getting someone to a calm environment where they're not restrained in any way, where they're sitting in a barca lounger. And you want to be able to sit down and say, I'm going to help you. Mm. I'm going to help you. And it may be me, it may be my psychiatry colleagues, we may do it together, but you and I are in this, we're going to get through it together. And now I have a completely different situation on my hands, right? Where I'm sitting openly, just like you and I are sitting next to one another. We're looking at each other in the eye. You have a problem. I want to help. Let's work on this together. Mm. So I've taken somebody out of a coercive situation. I've tried to bring them to sort of the least level of excitement possible. Because you can imagine if you're upset and scared and afraid and people are coming at you or restraining you or, or sit back down in the bed, like, how is that helping me? That's just going to take everything mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> up, 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 up. So how can we kind of repurpose our care and the way we talk to people to sort of calm? I'm already feeling calmer. Are you feeling? Because I was ready to throw the table over in anger, and now well, no. I was going to bring some lavender, but oh, that would have really yeah, that would have taken the edge off. Uh, well, so actually, what you're saying though, it sounds like it takes potentially more time, and don't we have a border, a crisis of too many borders in the ER that are taking up space and don't have beds? And how do how does this affect that if we start doing the right yeah. thing? So it's really fascinating, right? That whole that whole time thing. Don't I, I love that because it again circles right back to palliative care. Well, that takes too long, to, yeah. to have that conversation. Well, which takes less time, a four week stay in the ICU, or a forty five minute honest conversation with someone that maybe you sit down and are vulnerable and an authentic human being, and you actually establish a therapeutic alliance? Which takes less time in the grand scheme of things? When you figure that the average behavioral health patient who's coming to the emergency department in crisis, may be boarding for 48 hours or more. And in some places, like what you've got going on here in Las Vegas. Oh, it's a disaster here. Six days? Six days in the ER. Eight days? And these are young women who are having a crisis. They're young boys having a crisis. and They're stuck in a place next to a car accident or a trauma or it's... What takes more time? No, that 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 pretty much answers itself. And so in my mind... We all got into this profession to help people. That's what we did. Um, you know, whether we remember that or not, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm 30 years in almost. Yeah. But that's what we all signed up for. So what if we got back to that? What if we actually said, I'm here to help you and it's going to take as long as it takes. We're going to help you get that, get what the treatment you deserve. And I'm going to call my colleague who's a psychiatrist and we're going to get you started on treatment right away. So instead of this whole wait for the RPR to come back and everybody needs a bed on a locked ward, what if there was a different way? And it starts in the emergency department with the way people are interacting with folks. But then you've got this whole spectrum of care, just like you have for everything else, right? Right. Not all chest pain is a major MI, right? right? But you can admit to rule out for an MI and it takes what, 12 hours max? So what if I had that same approach with acute behavioral health? And so one of the things that we've established is what we call the empath unit, which is emergency medicine. And and it's emergency psychiatry, which is a different breed of cat than I'm in therapy and I'm on a couch and I'm working through my issues. Most Emergen- definitely. Yeah. yeah. Emergency psychiatry is as different uh, from sort of the rest of the practice of psychiatry as hospitalist medicine is to primary care. Yeah. Right? 
And everyone's got their sphere of expertise. So if you can get these folks in front of an emergency trained psychiatrist and you can initiate treatment right away and you can get them in a calm environment, you can actually send people home in about 12 to 16 hours with no holds, Mm. no emergency boarding, and for the hospital administrators out there, no excess overtime, no security, none of that other stuff, right? While you've been able to take this patient and put them in an environment they deserve that's healing while we're addressing these problems, now your emergency department bed is freed up for whatever's coming next. Right, right. Yeah, for the administrators, you want to tell them it's freed up for an elective uh, hip Possibly elective a knee. knee. Elective, elective knee. Elective that's right. Knee. knee. Yeah. That's right. No, and I think that's that's the thing. But here's the question. All this makes sense, right? So so how does your company, your group, your approach actually accomplish this? Because it sounds like a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. So, you know, I would, again, I would say it's kind of a spectrum of, of things, right? So you've got, on the one hand, you've got a retraining of the provider and a reacculturation of how it is that we can offer up care for folks and then you've got to be able to like teach people how to do that so that's something that i'd like to be able to say we do very well Mm -hmm. so i gotta be able to teach people how to do that um and you know changing doctors minds is no easy task as you as you know um and changing nurses minds can be no easy task but because of the high cost of what's happening to us right now i think everyone's interested Mm -hmm. and then you have sort of Okay, and then what does that care look like? And that care actually looks like everything from an inpatient bed, which is our kind of knee-jerk response, all walking all the way back to potentially discharging somebody from the emergency department. They've talked to a psychiatrist. They've gotten re-established on their medication. They've been able to calm down. They're hooked back up into a community setting. Okay, you say to me, well, we don't have that community setting, so how are we going to send somebody home? I say, well, we're going to put them in this sort of observation unit, if you will, that is expressly designed for the behavioral health challenge, Mm. where I've got a psychiatrist who's uh, maybe available remotely, maybe available, you know, on, on site, depending on the volume of people we're talking about. So we can talk to the doctor. We've got a bunch of nurses who are trained in de-escalation and and talk therapy. And then we actually have a bunch of people who've been through it. And they're and they're talk therapists. They are literally community volunteers who've experienced what we call the empath unit. And they are amazing. And they actually sit there with these folks in their, in their Barca loungers. And it doesn't matter what kind of space you've got. You've got space at your hospital to be able to do this. And these folks can say, you know what, we're going to get through this together. Here we are. It's, it's transformative. So this empath unit is like, uh, it's almost like a, a, like an OBS for MI, but Mm -hmm. for behavioral health. It's staffed with absolutely the right team to do that. And it is a team. It's a team. And here's the question. So who reimburses that? So that's what's actually interesting. Yeah. You can get paid for it. Oh, what? Yeah. yeah. So that's you can do good and do well. You can do good and do well. Um, and then you can actually go home and feel good about yourself, which is which is really nice, right? So that's the sort of like the, the triple win. The dividend. So instead of the lose, 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 we are actually. Which we have now. We are actually achieving the triple aim, which is, you know. Um, <laughs> Quadruple that, aim, right? Whatever that, add, oh, yeah. Add, for, sorry, I'm missing an aim. Add healthcare professionals in there. I'm, uh, I'm missing an aim. Yes. But uh yeah, you can get paid for it. And depending on the uh, county, there may be EMS um, dollars that are available. Um, but really for me, like if, when I talk to hospital administrators about this, it's more about a quote unquote cost control measure, which mm. is fine. Mm-hmm. You can start that way. Yeah. Until we change the way people think. People think. Yeah. Right. And so that's why I was psyched to talk to you about it, because in my mind, when when I hear you in Health 3.0, this is Health 3.0. The minute the minute you started talking about this, I was like, "This is about as three point yeah. as as fudge," because mm-hmm. it, it is it's about rehumanizing, repersonalizing care using a team based approach that puts patients and caregivers on a footing where they're both important and enables it with technology that doesn't obstruct, but rather brings us together. Yeah. So t- tell me about the technology piece. So the technology is really interesting because when I first we sort of were exploring this, I thought to myself, and again, here's just showing what little we all know. 
I thought to myself, how would someone who is acutely agitated or in duress mentally want to talk to a screen? Hmm. That makes no sense to me. And this came up nationally with this Kaiser uh, story about the robot telling the guy that he was terminal, right. which obviously it was more than that, and I did a show about it. But So it, this is a huge conceptual so it, issue. So it seems crazy, right? right? Where you say to yourself, now, if I am feeling concerned or delirious or agitated, I'm going to talk to a screen? Well, it turns out to be absolutely fascinating mm. because there is actually something about having the screen present that makes people feel safer. Isn't that fascinating? So that really, when you and I, we're looking at each other, yeah. right? And it's like one dog to another, right? I yeah. got your eyes and I'm, you know, and you're- I'm ready to pee in the corner. You're physically present with me. Right. That can be very intimidating. You, okay, okay, okay. I'm going to stop you for a second. I 1,000% agree with you. Yeah. I want that. And in fact, what we found at Turntable Health was that our patients sometimes preferred visits- with by either tele video or by phone because that edge of interpersonal mm -hmm. especially if they had behavioral health stuff because there was a a kind of a, a there was a reticence there which was understandable if you could put yourselves in their yep. shoes so please continue so i think of it almost like a buffer zone somehow mm. and and i mean really i guess you could sort of think of it as just general online behavior too right i mean you're sort of on or you're getting comments from people on your facebook live or whatever you can and, here. right yeah. and so as you're doing that people are like opening up to you they feel i think there's it's easier to be more vulnerable somehow mm. and i know that seems counterintuitive but i actually feel like people are more open, oddly, when there's tricky topics to have that buffer zone to really, they end up having this really important interaction with one another that, at least to my mind, I wouldn't have believed until I saw it and I saw it and I saw it and I saw it. And I haven't had a single person tell me that they would have preferred <laughs> to have face to face. I, I, I'm I a thousand percent with you and yeah. I would have disagreed had I not, do I not, so I have a tribe of supporters yeah. that subscribe to the show. It's a private group, just a few thousand people and every other night or so we have a talk where I'm talking to them, they're talking to me and a lot of them are here leaving comments. I will open up in a way that I don't open up to my friends, right. to my family, because there they are on the other side. I know that they're engaged, but I don't have that tension mm -hmm. or that inhibition that yep. comes. So so you're saying in the, in the behavioral health space, in the emergency department, a screen can sometimes actually be an asset. Yeah. Wow. See, that's huge. Now, I want to see if there's some comments here, because there have been so many. Uh, one says, Seth Narenberg quoted me saying, I'm ready to pee in the corner. That's some... Um, <laughs> It's a useful and instructive comment. Well, he, comment. you are Z dog, so there's it's that, true, I guess. It's true, with two Gs. If he lifts his leg, I'll let everyone know. Now, here's a question. So, Carolyn Rogers, um, our social workers are so bogged down with placement issues and discharges that their priorities are not doing groups or one-to-ones. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. How, do, how do we so deal with that? So, this isn't an add-on. So, so I, Carolyn, I, I'm right there with you. And, and you, you can't just tack this on as some other task mm. that the ED social worker or the ED case manager is now in charge of. Mm. It doesn't work that way. It has to be dedicated. It has to be someone who has a passion for the work. So um, those people don't necessarily grow on trees, but I think you'll find that it is so rewarding that there are more of them than you think. Mm. And it doesn't take a lot. So for example, we've done these empath units in a variety of different places. Um, one of the th ones that I actually think is the coolest is in, is in the city of Portland, where not one, not two, but four different health systems, so direct competitors, mm. came together to found what we call the Unity Center. And everyone in the city of Portland who comes to an emergency department who's having this sort of issue is transferred, no questions asked. There's no MTALA violations because it's considered a hospital outpatient department. No MTALA violation. You come, I don't care about your payment status, we're gonna take care of you. And they sit in this environment, we can take care of 30 folks at a time. So those are EDs from all over the city of Portland. They're talking to a psychiatrist, they're talking to a dedicated social worker, and we have all these talk therapists who literally spend their day willingly to volunteer to help people out. The average length of stay at this place is 16 hours, 
and 80% of the folks who go there are discharged home in 16 hours. So what does that mean? That means that all these different emergency departments don't have boarding issues. All these different caregivers aren't suffering from compassion fatigue, and people are getting the care they deserve in a humane, safe, comforting, actually therapeutic environment. So, so okay, that, that sounds amazing. And I, I'll say this, like, you're relying on volunteer labor a little bit here, but they do it gladly. 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 Do you think you'd ever have trouble recruiting? No, and I don't think you actually need that. I mean, mm. that was one of those things where people asked former patients, right. asked if be. they could come back and help. It, are there legal problems with that? So everybody signs a release, yeah. you know, I mean, and you don't have to, if you don't want to talk to them, you don't have to talk to them. Got it. Well, so Devin Bullis leaves a comment here. That's fine for the 20-year-old who's depressed after a breakup and suicidal. There's no sitting down and having a nice chat with a six foot three violent manic schizo when they get Baker acted. Yep. What do you say to that? So I would, I would say to you that those are the folks that all scare us. Mm-hmm. Right. It's the it's the guy who's tatted up and methed out and he's got that sort of rage. OK, all of those things are true. But if you approached him in a calm environment that was non threatening, you could actually calm him down. Now, does that mean all comers are like can be kumbaya? Of course not. <laughs> right. Of course not. Right. But what I'm saying is, what if we tried that first? And if we try it first, what you'll actually find, because Scott Zeller, who is one of our sort of the founding guru of acute uh, emergency psychiatry, has said, like, when you actually sit down with these people and you talk to them like the human beings that they actually are, you will be amazed. And there's all sorts of videos out there, and I'd be happy to, like, share the links yeah, um, please, from the Yeah, please, we'll put it in the web post, yeah. Um, where you do see that guy who's just been Baker acted and who is in a in a homicidal range now actually getting the help that he knows he needs. And that actually brings calmness. Now, like I said, it's not 100 percent effective, but for crying out loud, if we even like the 80 20 rule applied to think of the good that we could do. Mm. So you you must be so Vituity must be operationalizing these across a few centers yeah all over the place yeah you know? um a lot of them we we don't even sort of we white label so to speak so university of iowa yeah uh, just started a huge program billings montana um portland uh working on stuff in the sacramento area i mean there's there's so many people need this and you know whether it's vituity or not vituity quite honestly i don't care what matters more to me is that we have a conversation about how this care gets delivered and we change what we're doing because what we're doing is not working so how would people connect with vituity either as a clinician who wants to work with you guys or as an organization that wants to learn from you i mean it's all on the website so vi vituity.com. Vituity.com. Or feel free to email me. It's denise.brown. I mean, it's it's not that hard at vituity.com. Vituity? Yeah. Oh, you're going to get some mail, girl. Well, maybe so. I mean, It's no. worth it, though. Um, I, I think it is. I think this is... To me, this is kind of the burning platform of American healthcare. And we can, we can leave politics aside. But when you lump in the opiate crisis and, and you recognize that that is untreated... Mm mental illness mm. and you put those two together and that's why I always call it behavioral health. Cause to me, all the dual diagnosis stuff goes together. Yeah. So yeah. if we're going to do something about the opiate crisis, if we're going to do something about people who are coming to see us and we're not able to care for it, like then we've got to shake it up. Yeah. Well to me, so obviously we'll put all the links and all that and look, yeah. that's great. That's that again has to do with you. You found a problem as a clinician we share the same training. I see the same problem. You actually went and did something about it. You went out there. You're part of a group that's trying to make things better. People will always complain, well, you're a for-profit company, and of course, but that's, listen, Health 3.0 is powered by innovation and entrepreneurial clinicians, yeah. frontline people who see a problem and they want to do well financially by doing good, by sleeping at night, by helping their fellow human beings. And I see this as a great example of that. Yeah. And, you know, there was a lot about sort of regaining that joy and about that reason we went in. And you and I were talking even before the show, and I remember we, it's funny how two hospitalists, 
can quickly slip into that patois of, oh. oh my gosh, did you ever at any point start hating people, just hating people in the hospital and getting angry? And I'm like, yep, yep, I was there, I was there, I was there. It's a common experience. And the thing is, we internally will blame ourselves for being less than good people right. for feeling that way, but it's not. It's because we're actually creating a defense against an insur- what we see as an insurmountable Absolutely. challenge to our morality, our ethics, and who we are as people. And it's human nature, right? I mean, at, at some point, you have to go into hunker down mode. So, mm. you, you know, you, you kind of pull your shell over you and, and you bring that sort of like gallows humor to work. And Lord knows we all know it. I mean, and there's something fun about venting. There's something fun about, you know, cracking the jokes that you sort of hear all the time until you realize that there really isn't. Mm. And and that, mm. that your heart is actually bruised. Yeah. And that's what you're doing. And so you have this kind of self-deprecating kind of defense mechanism that that really is just not okay. Um, and, and there's and once you sort of get to that epiphany, you say, okay, well, it's really easy to sit and either Monday morning quarterback or complain about how everything's wrong, right? Where is the skill in that? Where is the talent in sitting around and bemoaning the fact that this doesn't work and that doesn't work and administrators and insurance companies and all of that stuff? Like, yes, all of those things are true. And none of it takes any talent. We all know. What takes talent is to be the person who's going to stand up and say, but it could be different and I'm going to put it out there. Uh And maybe you won't like me for it or maybe you want to send me like hate emails or whatever. That's okay. I have to accept that as the kind of cost of doing business. But I know that this isn't right and I know that we should be able to do what's right. So let's just go do it already. That is the ZPAC Health 3.0 call to action, if I've ever heard it put, and it has to be a fellow clinician who puts it. It can't be anybody else nope. who says stuff like that and gets away with it because we all know it's true. Absolutely. And denise.brown at vituity. <laughs> now I'm afraid. Com. No, you shouldn't be. You shouldn't be. Because if you get even a third the amount of emails I get, about 10% of them are so transformative in terms of right. informing you. It's like a, a world of sensors out in the community that are doing this stuff and can inform you and teach you and, and, and inspire you. And that's how we get better, right? Yeah. I mean, the, the whole idea of, oh, so-and-so knows better because they're in the C-suite of this organization or that hospital or whatever. Mm. Like, that's a bunch of crap. No, it's a tower. It's yeah. The, it's the people who are on the, on front, the front lines doing the work who come up with the answers. And for those of us who are now maybe sitting in the ivory tower or who have worked our clawed our way up to it, mm. the smart thing to do is to listen to those people, right? <laughs> I mean, so like this is this is born out of necessity um, and, and necessity is truly the mother of invention. And that's when we all do it together, then all the boats rise. Yeah. And that's, that's the whole point. I'm with you a thousand percent. What are you gonna do for paramedics, by the way? So these guys, I mean, Lord knows that, I mean, when you would talk about moral injury and, and oh. passion fatigue, I mean, I... I've gotten so many emails. I, 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 I literally, my heart breaks every day for it because let's be honest, when you and I are seeing people, they're already kind of packaged, mm-hmm. right? Um, and even to the extent, even the, even the ED doc is, is seeing an already kind of packaged thing, Right. But that poor paramedic, when, when, when he or she goes on a call and, and they're either in the ravine on the side of the freeway mm. or digging through the piles of trash that are blocking the entrance to somebody's home, that's a whole different level of moral injury. And to know that they don't have access to tools and techniques that could help, what if we could give those to them? What if you could start that? And yeah, maybe they need to come to the ED. Sure, that's fine. But what if we were able to kind of begin that dialogue early, either with a remote access to the emergency medicine doc Mm. or remote access directly to the psychiatrist? Mm. Like, I mean, you have the technology in your hand, (laughs) right? What if we use that in a way that helped people more than just... Well, this is what we have to do with them because this is what we've always done with them. And that could be what powers community paramedicine as part of the spectrum of Health 3.0. Starting Please. at pre-hospital care, the hospital, the ER, the ICU, post-hospital rehab, long-term care, hospice palliative care. It's all one spectrum and all these techniques work everywhere. They do. Heaven forbid. Period. Denise Brown, you solved healthcare. Oh, girl. I wish. I uh-huh. wish. <laughs>
<laughs> man, 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 I love man. It. So there are so many comments. We're we'll just have to go through later and go through them. And That's answer. awesome. Yeah. I'm, you know, what makes me happy is that I think this obviously is something that resonates and it's all over the place. And and the I hope that the people who are commenting realize that they're actually part of the solution and that we actually have to kind of link arms together. And it doesn't matter if you're a paramedic or a nurse or a doc or a social worker, whatever, like we are all part of the solution. And we're also right now, we're part of the problem. So let's heal ourselves first. And then think of all the good we can do. Think of all the things that we can do for people. Like, um, you know, some of the, some of the feedback that we've gotten from people who have experienced this approach have, has, I mean, it, it literally brings tears to my eyes and I'm not a crier. Um, I've been to eight ERs in, in the LA County area. I've always felt like I was treated like an animal. And then I happened to be lucky enough to go to little company of Mary. And I happened to be lucky enough to be in this empath unit. And now for the very first time, I feel like I've been on my feet. It's been six months. I haven't been back. Wow. Like, Wow. Are you kidding me? Like it gives me goosebumps. That means you're doing good in the world. And it may not be an answer for everybody. It may be in me that there's a lot of work to do. Nothing is perfect. But I say this is a start that I have not, I've not encountered so much in the space yeah. until we met. And so I wanted to bring it to the ZPAC. I want people to check out Vituity, Vituity.com. I like saying vituity because it has a certain yeah. No, it vibe. seems snappy, but yeah. like when we were doing this weird name thing, uh, it was vital and acuity that ah, I was putting together. Vituity. I know it sounds a little yeah. crazy, but that's but it why. Works. Yeah, it works. It makes me. We're at the heart of better care. That's our tagline, and I know it sounds stupid to have a tagline, but something about being at the heart of better care like means to me that you got to work for it. It doesn't just show up. Are Are you willing to mentor young physicians who are looking to be entrepreneurs in the world as well? I am pleased as punch to mentor entrepreneurial physicians or PAs or nurse practitioners or paramedics or whomever, right? Because that whole like, oh, the doctors are going to fix this is a bunch of crap. It's nonsense. Yeah. It's a bunch of crap. We're pretty out to Um, lunch and we're busy. Let's, let's all do it together. I've I've never, I've never had that whole um, weird power dynamic thing. I think it's completely antiquated and and total BS. I had it for a minute and then a nurse put me in my place and I've never had it since. <laughs> and I know exactly where that nurse was. You know where it was. <laughs> we, we were both at Stanford. We know. Guys, uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Denise Brown, a colleague from way back, working with Vituity to transform not just behavioral health uh, care, but other, other aspects of care as well. But we're focusing on behavioral health because it's a crisis. And we will put links to your stuff yeah. in the show notes on zdogmd.com. If you guys are fans, email her, denise.brown at vituity.com. And uh, if you're an anti-vaxxer, uh, don't email her because uh, she'll just make fun of you. Uh, and on, the <laughs> Or you can forward it to me and I'll make fun of them. How's that? On that note, ZPAC, <laughs> thank you for joining us for this. Please share it with people that you care about who are trying to make things better so we can all be a little less morally injured and sleep a little bit better and feel a little more connected to and our And love passion. our jobs. Heaven I mean, forbid. we are honored to get to take care of people on their worst days. We have a sacred obligation but honestly it's a sacred joy to be able to do it and you can argue with me about the word sacred but the fact of the matter comes down to this i have an opportunity to sit down and help you feel better and that is tremendous and i have nothing but gratitude for it and i want to make sure that each and every one of us who are lucky enough to be in this profession of healthcare get to have that gratitude every day and every single one of these thousands of comments would agree with that statement. It is a sacred calling, and however you define sacred, I'm an atheist, I consider it a sacred it calling, is. what it we is. do. On that note, I don't think I could summarize it better. We out, thank you, Dr. Brown. Peace. Thank you, Z-Dog. Boom. West side, or east side, it's cool. <laughs> it's cool.